religious journeys are meandering ones sometimes, and mine has been a meandering one. Uh, as Rose mentioned, I'm married to a Jewish woman, and so I take it that that means I get to tell Catholic Jewish jokes every now and then. So I'm going to start off by telling you one. Uh, Moshe and Yitzhak are walking down the street together in Brooklyn. And they come across a big Catholic parish, and there's a sign up front that says, Join the Catholic Church today, earn 20 bucks. <laughs> and Moshe elbows Yitzhak and says, You should do it. And so Yitzhak sort of shrugs his shoulders and walks up the sidewalk, goes into the church, spends about 30 minutes with the priest, comes slowly walking back out the door. Goes, uh, walks up to Moshe on the sidewalk, and Moshe says, So? Did you get your 20 bucks? And Yitzhak says, Is that all you people think about? <laughs> <laughs> now, in a way, that was a joke about religious enthusiasm. I can tell that joke to Jewish audiences and friends, and I do just as easily as I told it to you. But that's because it plays on the notion that one can become a Christian in a very short amount of time, which, of course, one can't do in just about any other uh, world religious tradition. And you're able to laugh at it in part, surely, because you recognize the fervency of Moshe and Yitzhak. You recognize the fervency that we've all seen in a fresh convert when he addresses his old friend on the sidewalk and he emerges from the church, you can see that, and you probably recognize some of that in the people that you've known. I'm simultaneously drawn to religious enthusiasm and frightened by it. There are many instances in history when an enthusiast forever altered what a founder had accomplished. For instance, as you probably know, there's no end to academic speculation on St. Paul's impact on the early church and the beginning of Christianity and how he may or may not have somehow altered the message of Jesus. Melanchthon created Lutheranism out of Martin Luther's rough and tumble protests. Moses never saw the promised land, but those who followed him certainly did. And there are many others. I'm interested in what happened in Francis of Assisi's life and perhaps even to early Franciscanism. There's a truth about history, about someone's life, that only comes out clearly when we look at his struggles. But people very rarely pause to consider what Francis's struggles were. In many ways, they define his life. There's no intended surprise the enthusiast in my book and in the title of my talk and in this talk is Elias of Crotona, one of Francis's closest friends in their spiritual brotherhood, a friend since childhood. Elias is one of the first to join him to believe in what he was doing in his religious vision, to embrace the gospel-loving poverty that Francis was living. Many thought Francis was crazy. But from the early days, Elias was his friend and his confidant and his follower. The two men grew up together in the final decade of 12th century Assisi. Before thousands of others are attracted to Francis's life, like bees to a hive, they begin to lead a spiritual movement to rebuild churches, care for the sick, free the complacent, and one of the truly original aspects of his charism dance and sing as God's troubadours to the delight of people who had grown tired of a tumultuous church. Theirs was the era of the Crusades, of course, and it was the era just before the Inquisition. The movement rose quickly, but at the height of the spiritual renaissance they sparked, once Francis has become a saint and Elias its, ecclesi its, its ecclesiastical head, something goes terribly wrong. Elias becomes known as the devil in the eyes of many, a traitor to the ideals. And the question is, what happened? For all his wisdom in other aspects of life, Francis is blinded by affection for his friend. 
And by the time he prematurely dies, the situation grows even worse. Ousted from leadership of the order soon after Francis' death, Elias relentlessly insists on building a lavish basilica to honor his friend's memory and is supported by the Pope in that work. Then one night, in secret, distrustful of everyone around him, he transfers Francis's body, which had been essentially lying in state, in a stone sarcophagus to the crypt of the new church, secretly burying it there. Francis's bones are then not seen again for 600 years. About a decade later, Elias leaves the order altogether and aligns himself with the emperor, who is openly at war with the Pope. Now, it was Oscar Wilde who once said, every great man nowadays has his disciples, and it's always Judas Iscariot who writes his biography. <laughs> so was Elias Francis's Judas? I don't think their story is that simple. But I believe that one can't understand who Francis was without understanding what happened between them, between Francis and Elias, and what Elias did with what Francis started. For those reasons, I like to take a different approach from all the other ways that people tell the life of Francis of Assisi. I think this idea of the enthusiast tells the story of Francis' life through the lens of the relationship that most consoled him, but which also most challenged, disturbed, and upset him. Above all, I think it's important to unravel the complexities of a relationship between two men and how it changed their world and along the way draw a fuller picture of how idealism can be undone by the enthusiasm of just one devoted follower. I've been captivated by Elias of Cortona, also known as Elias of Assisi, for almost as long as Francis has held my attention. Paul Sabatier's biography of Francis, which was published originally in 1894, introduced me to the life of Francis. And Elias plays no small part in it. Soon after reading Sabatier's account as a teenager, I turned to the New Catholic Encyclopedia, Volume 5. And there on page 273, I must have read the account of Elias and gazed at the characteristically dark picture of him dozens of times. Thirty years later, when I began to research the book that I wrote about the two of them, I went back to Volume 5, and I was captivated by the picture of credit it refers to that dark image of Elias, and it says that it was reproduced from an obscure portrait based upon his image in a painting of the crucifixion in the upper basilica of St. Francis of Assisi. Then I realized that it hasn't been possible for hundreds of years to scrutinize the painting in question, made upon a crucifix by Gionta Pisano, a contemporary of Elias. The painting was lost long ago, but we know from other sources that it was created by Pisano, on commission from Elias, and we know that the inscription written on it by the artist almost cheekily read, Brother Elias had me made, Gianta Pisano painted me in the year of our Lord 1236. Jesus Christ have mercy on the prayers of pious Elias. <laughs> that commission was from a painter whose style bent toward the Gothic suffering Christ. In contrast to such a deathly looking savior, which we see in three other signed icon crucifixes created by Pisano as well, the icon crucifix that spoke to Francis, as you probably know, at San Damiano, imagined a different sort of Christ, one with an open face, smiling, offering himself. Maybe you can picture that San Damiano Christ. It is that image, not the Gothic man of suffering, that continues to speak to most people who want to encounter the real Francis. There's another painting on the wall of the lower church of the Basilica in Assisi that I want to mention. Historians believe that it is by, it is by Cimabue, and not necessarily the oldest we have of Francis, but probably the most accurate and realistic. It reveals a short, swarthy, simple man not a handsome knight. He's showing the marks of stigmata in his two hands, but what you see is more of a humble friend than a saint. Art historians pondering that picture have wondered if there was once another figure on the other side of the wall on which it's painted, 
beside the Madonna and Christ Child, matching the Shimabui Francis portrait. My studies have taken me a long way toward imagining a portrait of one of Francis' closest friends hanging there, what Elias might have looked like, and then why the image of him would have eventually been erased from that wall. As Rose mentioned, I wrote an earlier book a couple of years ago called When St. Francis Saved the Church. And as the title sort of indicates, in that book I attempted to say something about the, what I call the spiritual genius of man. This time I wanted to set out to understand his struggle, because you can't understand Francis without understanding his struggle. That said, there's a certain naivete to the popular images of Francis. Zipporelli and Kazantzakis have taught us the myth of the wandering nature poet, lover of song and women, communicator with wildlife. They didn't create this soft Francis out of thin air. The legends were well established before them. They are probably even part of our collective unconscious when it comes to holy people. The brothers Grimm knew the meme when in 1812 they had Cinderella communicating with pigeons. That's how they heard the story from old Germans who had passed it down for centuries. The saint who talks to critters is a romantic motif that connects a human figure with deep spiritual undercurrents. There's no question that Francis held a special relationship to the created world. He was gentle in ways that we hardly understand today. There's no reason to doubt that. But those were not his most defining qualities. Even John Keats had to go from smiling upon the flowers and the trees, as he put it, to finding the agonies, the strife of human hearts. So did Francis, I think, and then some. In his book, Young Man Luther, Eric Erickson wrote, human nature can best be studied in a state of conflict, suggesting that we may have the opportunity to know Francis best by focusing on difficult periods in his life. The early biographers didn't linger on Francis' sadness, his feelings of having been betrayed. And for political reasons, they also didn't linger over reasons for those emotions or the abdication that he made for his own order. But we should, I think, and I do. The romantic narrative of generations ago also obscures the secondary characters in the story they offer up caricatures rather than what seem to be real people. Pope Innocent III, for example, usually appears older and less nuanced than he really was. And Claire usually looks and sounds like Cinderella. <laughs> the most interesting plot point in the story of Francis and Elias' friendship actually take, takes place about three and a half years after Francis' death. This is what happened in Assisi on May 22, 1230. Upon the rock that perches Assisi above the plain below in the southwestern corner of town <coughs> is a promontory that was once known as the Hill of Hell. It was a place where criminals were executed, their bodies tossed over the side, left to rot in the rain and sun out of view. Children were told by their mothers not to go near that miserable place hanging above the valley. Roman city planners modeled the Hill of Hell after Gehenna from the outskirts of the old city of Jerusalem. It is better for you that one of the parts of your body perish than for your whole body to be thrown into Gehenna, Jesus preached in the first century. The unrepentant and the heretic could not, according to medieval laws, be buried in holy ground. That is why places such as Hills Hell, Hell's Hill existed in medieval towns. The bodies of those who died outside the church had to be disposed of somewhere. Ironically, there was no corresponding law against burying a good Catholic in an unclean place. Five months after Francis' death, Cardinal Ugolino, Francis' special advisor, was elected to the chair of St. Peter. Taking the name Pope Gregory IX, his papacy was, from the beginning, built upon his reputation as friend of the greatest saint since the Apostles. It was said that Francis had turned to Ugolino for fatherly guidance of his order, to protect it and its ideals from those who would steer it in ungodly paths. Others saw things differently, that Ugolino, together with Elias and others, 
seized this control and were themselves party to steering the friars away from the ideals of their founder. Eighteen months after Francis' death, on April 29, 1228, Pope Gregory issued a papal decree announcing his intention to build a specialis ecclesia, special church, to honor Francis. Special indulgences were granted to all who made contributions. Francis's body had been resting in its wooden tomb at San Giorgio, across town, but now Elias acquired the Callus Inferni, or Hill of Hell, where thieves and murderers were executed and buried in a series of land grants from prominent to seasoned citizens, and plans were underway to transform the land to the glory of God. Both Gregory and Elias remembered conversations with Francis about sin, the body, and death. Perhaps they believed that burial on the hill was a way of keeping Francis's desire to be regarded as the lowliest of all. Medieval people often pondered how they might appear before the judgment seat of Christ after death. The belief was that a dead person, body and soul, would go to judgment to face the question of eternal destiny, and it was important to make the right impression. For example, the 16th century German emperor Maximilian I who was no saint, left instructions that his body should be burned, his teeth smashed in, and his head shaved upon death. Despite what the earthly record might show, Maximilian wanted to at least appear physically penitent when he appeared before God. <laughs> we will make us easy the new Jerusalem, Elias was saying to all who would listen. He was devoted to the places he and Francis had shared, especially their beloved town. It was more beautiful than Compostela, closer than Jerusalem to the center of the Holy Roman Empire, devoid of Rome's stench and menace, and deserved, Elias believed, because of Francis, to become the world's pilgrimage destination. Now, with pilgrims come coins. Stitched into their belts or folded into their shoes, Pilgrims possessed gold and silver and quietly carried it to where it might do them the most good. A seasons needed their gold now more than ever. Even Solomon had to beg and hoard in order to build a temple. Pope Gregory arrived in Assisi about three months after that papal bull, intent on putting Elias' plan to action. He had announced that the inferno hell was to be renamed Paradise and offered 40 days of indulgence to anyone who helped fund the construction. Now during an elaborate ceremony at San Giorgio, he pronounced Francis a saint of heaven, which was a surprise to no one. Thomas of Chilano had just written, just published in his first biography of Francis, new miracles are constantly happening at Francis' tomb, speaking about what was happening at San Giorgio. The blind have recovered sight, the deaf they're hearing, the lame their ability to walk, the mute their voices, even those with gout start to jumping, and lepers become clean. His dead body heals those who are alive. San Giorgio was a busy marketplace of miracles for nearly two years while Francis lay there. The evidence for the Pope's declaration of canonization was overwhelming. Two days later, on July 18, 1228, the Pope laid the foundation stone on a vast platform where this new paradise was underway. And while Francis's body still lay in a wooden tomb upon the floor in the crypt of San Giorgio, Elias was named the architect of the new basilica. It was as if the vision of Ezekiel of a valley of dry bones was becoming a reality, taking place in Umbria. I will make his name great on earth as it is now in heaven, Elias remarked. A new church building of the magnitude of the Basilica of San Francesco was not undertaken lightly. From the start, Elias and Gregory envisioned this place as a new tabernacle of Moses, a divine space where God would dwell with his people. It was quite literally meant to be a gateway to heaven, to be built on the foundation of the saint whom they knew so well. Within two years, the lower church was completed. And six years later, the upper church was under construction, to be eventually adorned with frescoes by Giotto and others depicting iconic scenes from the life of Francis and his brothers. Gold-leaf paintings even adorned the ceilings. 
all to honor a man who didn't even want his brothers to own their own rivers. Why should I defend him? Elias said to anyone who challenged his decisions. It was our Lord himself who praised the man who builds a house upon a firm foundation, secure deep in the rock below. When the rains come, and they will come, the house will be safe. The Basilica became one of the greatest architectural and artistic achievements of the late Middle Ages. Even though the Franciscans who oversaw its design and construction assured themselves that their church stood apart from the ostentation of French Gothic, which was then in vogue. Their building, for instance, left off facade towers and kept the windows only circular on the facade. There is no denying the tremendous gifts that Elias possessed for architecture and organization. Apses and transepts were his gift. They are magnificent. The speed and efficiency of the construction were remarkable. As a religious leader of a large order who was also architect of a great church, the only real accurate comparison and medieval precedent for Elias is Abbot Sugar of St. Denis outside Paris a century earlier. <clears throat> Gregory IX would later honor Elias by declaring through another papal bull that the Basilica was the mother church for all Franciscans, a title that had previously been used by Francis only for his beloved tiny chapel, the Portiuncula. That was in April 1230. Now, all of this disgusted a handful of Francis's closest friends. They knew what Francis would have wanted, and it probably wasn't any of this. Pilgrims had flowed to San Giorgio from all parts of Christendom, but Elias believed it was only a temporary solution. God's protective arm had kept danger from visiting his friend's remains there, but there also was a question of paying proper respect. Elias was determined to secure Francis's honor and legacy for all time. Perugians threatened Assisi at every turn and wouldn't hesitate to steal the body of the neighboring town's blessed hero. One only has to consider what happened 18 months later during the burial of Elizabeth of Hungary to see that Elias's paranoia was actually well-founded. Elizabeth, who became a Franciscan and founder of hospitals, was already famous for sanctity and quick on her way to being sainted when she died at just the age of 24 in November 1231. This is why, while her body was in the process of being buried in Marburg later that day, the faithful tore at the clothes, hair, ears, and nails of the cadaver, as it's told in an old chronicle. The same thing happened to the body of Anthony Pedro, the Franciscan friar. Despite his love for theology earlier that year in June, they lost parts of Anthony too before they decided several months later to begin construction of a basilica to safeguard his remains. The body of the greatest saint since St. John the Evangelist was supposed to be transferred to the crypt of the new lower church of Elias' great basilica before a gathered assembly that included cardinal legates sent by Pope Gregory the Ninth members of the papal curia, friars, bishops, invited guests, townspeople. A ceremony was planned for May. Bonaventure, in the penultimate paragraph of his official life of Francis, writes that on that day, as the holy treasure, meaning Francis's body, was being removed to its new resting place, God deigned to work many miracles so that by the fragrance of the healing power of Francis' body, the hearts of the faithful would be drawn closer to Christ. But as the thousands of friars who were gathered, because the Pentecost general chapter meeting was set to begin the following day, would soon realize Francis' body wasn't there. Elias had secretly buried it three days earlier. Or, so he said, the location of the body of Francis would remain a mystery, as I mentioned, for 600 years. You have to imagine the scene. It's May 22nd, 1230, and there is Elias pounding in the rock below the altar in the lower church, finishing preparations that had already been extensive and detailed. He has recently been replaced as Minister General of the Franciscan Order, 
But no matter, he told himself and everyone else, he had more important work to do. Elias worked hard to create Francis' final resting place, a stone sarcophagus wrapped by a cage of iron bars in a cavern hewn from the mountainside. But there he is in the dead of night, the last person to seal up that rocky tomb. Reaching into his cassock pocket, he takes out a handful of coins. Holding them up just enough to catch the flickering light of the candle, he pauses a moment to consider the silver. Now the Franciscan rule forbade a friar from even handling money, but Elias gently places the coins beside the dead hand of his friend. Whether this was a strange gesture of repentance, a wise recognition that someone in the future would someday need to authenticate the body of Francis, or a gift of misunderstanding, we'll never know for sure. I'm sorry, Holy Father, I imagine, he might have said, forgive me now for what I must do. And then he sealed it up. Two days later, a purple-draped, oxen-drawn wagon carried the sturdy wooden coffin that had witnessed all of those miracles at San Giorgio to the lower church of San Francesco. The crowd tried to touch what they believed contained the holy relics of their holy brother and favorite son. Walking solemnly behind the carriage was an orderly gathering of friars and bishops and cardinals. Trumpets blew. Only a handful of those who were present knew that it was all for show. Pilgrim's guides and pamphlets would for centuries indicate only that the tomb of St. Francis is located under the high altar, not unlike St. Peter's bones, which for 2,000 years have been considered the foundation of the Basilica in Rome. Certain Franciscans and popes knew the precise location of the body over those subsequent centuries. This knowledge was passed down like all of the most intimate secrets of the Church, in private conversations from one dying minister general, cardinal protector, or pope to the next. But the rest of the world was left to believe that in burial, just as in life, Francis was like Christ. And Bartholomew of Pisa put it late in the 4th, 14th century, as Christ's tomb was sealed and watched by guards, so St. Francis's tomb has been sealed to prevent his body ever being visible to anyone. So you see, even after death, they had a complicated relationship, Francis and Elias. The most common interpretation of what happened that day is that Elias acted with selfish or sinister intent. His hiding Francis' body in the tomb is seen in a much wider context of the general degrading of his reputation that took place over the next 20 years. But making the matter more complicated, Francis himself never accepted that understanding of his close friend when he was alive. The first person to specifically accuse Elias was another Franciscan, Thomas of Eccleston. But strangely, he waited until 1258, more than a generation after the events took place. Elias's ignominy was firmly established by that time. There was plenty of evidence for demonizing him. First of all, at the general chapter meeting immediately following Francis' pretend burial, Elias was carried on the shoulders of a handful of friars into a gathered assembly as they chanted for him to be renamed Minister General. That's a lot of arrogance. The majority of friars cattle called Elias and his handful of friends out of the room that day. Ever since Francis' death, many of the brothers believed that Elias' tactics were morally wrong and reflected a spirit that ran counter to what anyone would expect from a Franciscan. Another friar, John Parenti, had been elected Minister General in 1227, and it was John who was re-elected at that general chapter meeting on that day when Francis was carried, I mean when Elias was carried in on the shoulders. No matter, Elias rationalized, for he needed time to construct his shrine for Francis. Once he put the finishing touches on the lower church, he could and would more properly maneuver himself back into a position of leadership. Pope Gregory IX was aware of what Elias was doing. Elias had at least tacit approval for hiding Francis' body in the lower church that day. This explains why Gregory doesn't name Elias 
in the furious call he issues to a seasoned officials three weeks later. Gregory was incensed because he wasn't consulted for the exact time for smuggling Francis' bones. Gregory had arranged for one of his cardinal legates to be present at Elias' side when the holy cadaver was laid in its final resting place. Elias wasn't supposed to do it early and not alone. That last minute betrayal is what led Gregory to fire off the papal bull, even though he couldn't reveal all the conniving that must have taken place behind the scenes. Gregory threatens to excommunicate the city officials unless they explain what happened. He imagines that someone, those officials, or perhaps one of the two bishops to whom he directed the bull, replaced him as Elias' confidant. Little does he realize just then how it was probably all Elias with just a few obedient, nameless friars. But this is where the enthusiast is a confusing, fascinating religious creature. Some call him a fanatic. Others point to the passion of his commitments. Elias' motivations for secreting away the body seemed to him to be pure. He was protecting Francis as he had done many times in the past. Elias secured a firmer footing for the order during Francis' lifetime. He helped his ailing, fr ailing friend when he needed medical care. He guided a blind Francis, clear of possible physical danger. And of course, he built a basilica to honor his legacy. Elias also knew, in a way not yet comprehended by Pope Gregory, how Assisi might remain the geographical and spiritual locus of the Franciscan movement. His fear of body snatchers even extended to the Pope himself, I believe, who may have had designs on some small bit or piece of the holy corpus to be laid to rest in the eternal city for the benefit of pilgrims, perhaps locked safely away in a jewel-crusted reliquary. But despite all of this, Instead of interpreting the secret transition of Francis in light of what happened in the weeks, months, and years after it happened, we should also try and understand what happened to Elias. How is it possible that he could have been so loved by Francis and so despised eventually by his fellow friars? Three years after Francis' death, in the first life of Francis, completed and approved in 1229, Thomas of Chilano records that Elias was the one whom Francis chose to be as a mother to himself, and also as a father to the other brothers. Francis appointed Elias as minister to the all-important province of the Holy Land, and later visited him there just after abdicating his leadership of the order. Elias was also one of the privileged few to have seen up close and firsthand what happened to Francis's body on Mount Laverna two years before Francis' death. And when Chilano wrote of Francis' deathbed scene, he tells us, there was a brother there whom Francis loved with the greatest affection. Some have suggested it might have been Brother Leo, but most people agree it was Elias. There was no question of Elias' devotion to Francis during both of their lifetimes. He was Francis' friend, his confidant, his source of strength. He was surely the one who accompanied Francis on all of those trips to the caves when Francis would go inside to pray for hours and his friend would stand outside waiting for him. The only one able to insist that Francis take medicine to alleviate pain, Elias often interceded when others failed. Even a decade after Francis' death, Elias possessed certain ardent defenders. Clara of Assisi, for instance, an unimpeachable witness, and another of Francis' closest confidants, praises Elias in one of her letters to Agnes of Prague just before the time when the troubles with Elias were about to reach their highest pitch. Agnes is concerned about compromises to the ideals of Franciscan poverty being allowed by Pope Gregory. Claire encourages her to follow the advice of our venerable father, our brother Elias, Minister General, when she says, prefer his advice to the advice of others and consider it more precious to you than any gift. Behind the iron grill that kept her separated from the world, Claire was probably unaware of all that Elias was doing. 
Her advice to Agnes was based on Elias' reputation, on what she knew Francis loved in him, rather than his current standing at that time. But by the time Shilano writes his second life of Francis, several years later, Elias is never once mentioned by name. When Francis is said to teach the qualities of a good friar to his brothers, his words sound as if they are pointed directly at condemning the sorts of things Elias had been recently accused of doing. Francis speaks of wicked men who carry poison on their tongues, and a double-tongued man who is the scandal of religion. The history of Francis' adult life and his friendship with Elias was being rewritten. A few years earlier, we see Elias succeeding John Parenti, elected once again to the post of Minister General. Elias' work of protecting the body of Francis and building Assisi into a great pal palace of pilgrimage is largely over, and then the growth of the order becomes his preoccupation. Over the next seven years, Elias expands the role of friars in the world, welcomes the ownership of property, the cultivation of learning, and the building of splendid churches and monuments, mostly undermining the humble intentions of his best friend. In 1239, about three years after Claire wrote that letter to Agnes, Elias is deposed by the Pope because of the overwhelming demand of his spiritual brothers. The friars found him arrogant and lusty for power. Fellow friar and historian Salomini of Adam tells us that Elias turned against his own. Salomini clearly felt betrayed by Elias, since he also remembered him when he was the good brother who had received him as a postulate when he was minister general, graciously sheltering the younger Salomini from an angry father who tried to thwart his conversion. Like a hawk poised to snatch a smaller bird out of the air, is one metaphor that was used to describe how the friars felt under Elias' leadership. Fear, an emotion nearly unexperienced and unexpressed by Francis, had become a prime motivator for Elias. Hot temper and increasingly paranoid, he disciplined freely by taking away precious possessions, such as reveries, demoting brothers to novices, a clear humiliation and sending disagreeable friars on long, unnecessary journeys, exposing them, like King David sending the husband of Bathsheba off to the front lines to mortal danger. Meanwhile, tributes and gifts, whether fancy foods, gold, or ornaments for the Basilica in Assisi were always arriving at Elias' minister general office as indulgences. Fine foods were added to his table, imported from all over the world. Cherries, crabs, eel, almond milk, and cinnamon became common and not only when he was entertaining. It was these compromises with the real world that due to the vast distance between original ideals and new realities ultimately made the Franciscan friar a bit of an object of ridicule. Elias began to live in splendor like a king, waited on by boys dressed in colorful shirts he was usually eating alone, away from the convent, food prepared by one of the brothers who was made his private chef. He couldn't have been any less Franciscan if he had tried. His arrogance was filled with impunity. When he needed to travel from one town or friary to another, he was most often unaccompanied by brothers and riding a horse, both violations of the rule. Even when going half a mile, it is said, he rode that beast. The spontaneity and wildness that his friend had celebrated, being willing to follow the spirit into the unknown, had been replaced by functionality, order, and planning. The friars even kept pets like puppies now. Not only did a friar have little connection to the natural world of things like cicadas and worms and swallows, but they had brought creation inside and domesticated. Throughout his rule as, Frank, as Minister General of the Order, Elias showed a preference to lay brothers over priestly ones when selecting lieutenants, even provincial ministers and friends. He was himself proudly non-ordained, a simple-styled friar, just, he believed, as Francis had been. 
Elias knew that Francis valued laymen, wanted all friars to be equally valued, and himself refused priestly ordination. There was even the memorable occasion when Francis begged a young postulate not to obtain his own reverie because of the sense of entitlement it might breed inside of him. Elias would ensure that the order remained faithful to things like this. But now, this distant from Francis's witness, after so many clerics had joined the order, there were many who viewed Elias's actions for what they also were, in attempts to avoid those who might disagree with him. The opposite was really the truth about Elias. His lack of ordination hadn't led to a deep humility. He was elaborately complicated a sort of bee's nest of unaddressed emotions, bolstered probably by a serious lack of confidence, which begins to explain why he distanced himself from those upon whom God may have been seen to have granted authority. His lay preferences would have a disastrous effect on the order then, after he was deposed. Elias' secretary, Brother Illuminato, asked to be relieved of his duties, and was sent to the friar in Siena. Brother Bernard, the first man who followed St. Francis in religious life, was forced to flee for his life and go into hiding in a remote province. Giles of Assisi and Brother Angelo, other very close friends of Francis, were soon hiding there as well. Everyone who had known the founder since the early days of his conversion knew that what Elias had done was nearly unforgivable. Sadly, before long, there was a serious split in the order between those who wanted to follow the rule precisely and faithfully and those who wanted to be a part of Elias' plan for growth. These differences turned into fights, and brother was often quite literally fighting against brother before long. Even the mild-mannered poet and historian Thomas of Chilano began to worry apocalyptically, seen in contemporary events a shadowing of the day of the world, at the end of the world. His Latin trochaic hymn was composed at this time, and it was inspired by the opening words of Zephaniah 1, 15 and 16. That day is a day of wrath, a day of tribulation and distress, a day of calamity and misery, a day of darkness and obscurity, a day of clouds and whirlwind. How ominous this hymn of his was, and how telling of the feeling of the order at that time, in stark contrast to what it had felt like during Francis' lifetime. How much tremor there will be when the judge will come, it goes. The trumpets scattering a wondrous sound through the sepulchres of the regions will summon all before the throne, went another one of the stanzas. And this was sung in the Roman liturgy for centuries, until the reform of the Latin Rite at Vatican II. But as I say, like every other Christian since Christ, Elias was a combination of good and bad. He was a puzzle. When he's finally deposed in 1239, Elias responds by rebellion, joining, joining with the excommunicated Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II, who is at war at that time with the Pope. Worst of all, Elias lends credence to Frederick II's claims to divine authority. Then, in rapid, startling succession, we see how he has gone from confidant to a saint to vicar of a despot, the church's enemy number one. He takes some of the friars with him in his fight, and the reputation of the order is again forever damaged. Salambini recounts I myself have heard a hundred times the singing of a little ditty by the Umbrian peasants whenever a friar was passing by. Frater Elias has gone astray and hath taken the evil way. At the sound of this song, the good brothers were cut to the heart. Again, I say, this is not how it all began. When Francis and Elias were boys, growing up together in Assisi, or when Elias joined Francis in the first days of the foundation of their order. Elias then makes a deathbed conversion. Certain good-hearted friars, old friends, go to find him in Cortona, where he sulks for years, and Elias weeps and apologizes. 
an entirely genuine recommitment to the order and to the church. The life of a religious enthusiast is always complicated. Elias's was more complicated than most, surely, and the events of his life wrapped up in the life, in the life of one of the most important Christians who ever lived. We need religious enthusiasm. But let me, let me conclude by suggesting that our enthusiasm must always be filled with and checked by faithful attention to the word, to the rule that we live by, and to each other. Thanks for listening.